I just want to remind us that uh, today is the third Sunday of the month, and as usual then we have um, an extended homily question-answer discussion. <clears throat> the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Mashiach, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after having considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did exactly what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. A gospel inspired by God. Was that encouragement, George, or was it, damn it? <laughs> Here we go again. <laughs> How many of you guys, when you were small kids, learned the prayer to the angel guardian? In Ireland, you know, every morning, you did? A whole bunch of you, great. So every morning we start off, and every night before you go to bed, you say, angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here, ever this day, be at my side, to light and guard, to rule and guide, yeah? Yeah, you got that? Brilliant. Fabulous. So, more or less. Let, let's, hear it in, let's hear it in Spanish. Carmen Sita. Angel de mi guarda, that's guardian angel. Dulce compañía is sweet company. Brilliant. No me desampares. Do not uh, forsake me or... Brilliant. Uh, okay. Ni de noche ni de día. Neither okay. day or night. Guys. Con Dios me apuesto. With God, I go okay. to bed. Con Dios me levanto. With God... I awake. Brilliant. The, uh, La Virgen María, the Virgin Mary. Okay. Me cubre con su manto, covers me with, with her. Beautiful mantle. Mantle. Awesome. Oh, it's beautiful, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, did you learn it in French? No. Oh, yeah. I missed that one. You missed that one. <laughs> <laughs> what about German? German? Or C? You can say it in German. Go ahead, Brigitte. Angel of God, my God, the, the prayer you learned as a little child about your angel guardian. Did you learn that prayer? Or did you have that in German? Mm, no, I don't remember. I, no point in asking you, Ursula, you were raised Protestant. You know, say, say it for the night. Go on. Okay. 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 Beautiful, Levine. Beautiful. Awesome. Kathleen, did you learn in Irish? No, in English. You learned it in English. Let's hear it. In California. In California. Let's, <laughs> let's hear it in California English. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love permits me here, ever this day be at my side, to light, to find, to rule. So are you leaving now? Are you, yeah. are you leaving? Have you had enough? Okay, okay. We just. You don't have any papers, okay. Good. You're excused temporarily. Like, okay. Bill. Okay, okay. There's all the versions we need. Um, so it's interesting, there are more people in the United States of America, according to a 2009 census uh, survey, that believe in angels than believe in global warming. 
the figures are 55% versus 36. 55% of Americans, according to a 2009 survey, believe in angels, and 36% believe in global warming. In, in Canada, a survey done in 2008 showed that 67% of Canadians believe in angels. And in fact, polls that are taken throughout the world, they, re they represent that. A majority of people believe in angels. So angels is not some kind of, you know, a new age, you know, fashion. This is an old, old uh, belief system. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about angels. And I'm going to divide the homily into two sections. For the first section, I'm going to just do a quick review of some of the great wisdom traditions and what they had to say about angels. And then in the second section, I'm going to do some free thinking, my own ideas about uh, what angels are. So the first piece, I'm going to look just very briefly at six wisdom traditions. I'm going to have a quick look at um, Zoroastrianism, then Judaism, then Christianity, then Islam, then Mormonism, and then Theosophy. Just give us a flavor for some of the wisdom traditions. So I'll just say one thing about Zoroastrianism, you know, insofar as they speak of angels. But with the preface that Zoroastrianism had a huge impact on the evolution of Judaism and through Judaism on Christianity. Huge impact, particularly when the last two tribes of Israel were taken into exile in Babylon between 587 BCE and 529. They came under the, the influence of the great Persian religion, Zoroastrianism. Had a huge impact. And in fact, the entire third part of the Hebrew scriptures, what are called uh, the, the Kitubim or the writings, are hugely influenced by their sojourn in Babylon under the influence of Zoroastrianism. But as far as angels go, in Zoroastrianism, there's the belief system that every human being has what's called a fravashi. And a fravashi is a personal guardian angel. And so the, um, the Israelites would bring this teaching back into the land of Israel in 529. And there would still be lots of controversy you know, in Judaism about this issue right down to the time of Christ. So you had two huge theological parties in Israel at the time of Jesus. You had the Sadducees, who were the priestly theologians, who didn't believe in life after death, or spirits, or angels. And you had the Pharisee class, who were lay theologians that believed in all three. And in one famous occasion, the Sadducees would try to trip Jesus up on this question. But just to say a few words then about Judaism. Judaism uses four different terms to speak of angels. Um, the first term is Beni Elohim. Now, Elohim is a very interesting word in Hebrew because it's a plural. And so initially, uh, Judaism was not monotheistic. Moses, for instance, was not a monotheist. Even when Moses gave us the commandments, the first of which said, first I am the Lord your God, you're not allowed to have other gods in front of me. He was not advocating or preaching a monotheism, he was advocating monolatry, which is very different. Monolatry is the worship of one God, but not the belief that there is only one God. So Moses was not a monotheist. He was saying, guys, there's lots of gods out there, but this particular God that we're going to call Yahweh has made a contract with us. You're not allowed to put anybody else in front of him. In fact, right down, monotheism only really enters Judaism during the Babylonian exile, so 700 years after Moses. And so the first two terms that they'll use for angels, the first one is Bene Elohim, which means the sons of the gods. So they're plural. Elohim is a plural word in Hebrew. And the second term they'll use for angels is Malach Elohim. Malach being a messenger. So they're messengers of the gods. Then when Judaism becomes monotheistic, they'll use a third term for them. They will call them Malach Yahweh. Uh, the messengers of God. Now, the gods have been collapsed down to a single individual who will be given the name of Yahweh. And the fourth term you find in the Hebrew scriptures is HaKodeshim. Uh, Kodesh in Hebrew means uh, holy or sacred. So HaKodeshim would be the holy ones, the, the sacred ones. So you'll, you'll find these four terms being used throughout uh, the Hebrew scriptures for the, for the angels. Now, when you take any one of them, say, for instance, take Malach. Malach mean, meaning a messenger. But even the term messenger has uh, three different connotations in the Hebrew Scriptures. So when they say even Malach Yahweh, the messenger of God, this messenger can be somebody who has been sent from God, a delegate from God, or it can be an aspect of God himself. So, for instance, a great uh, Jewish scholar called Philo of Alexandria talked about um, the angels as the logos 
So an, it's an aspect of the divine. And Christianity will borrow this term very significantly. In John's gospel particularly, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God, and the Logos became human being and dwelt among us. And so it can be a messenger from God, it can be an aspect of God, or it can be God himself. And so there's a great story, for instance, in the book of Genesis, where Abram is visited by angels. And because there's, there's a compilation of many different sources in the Hebrew Scriptures, there are four different traditions that have been combined and kind of redacted and edited and put together. They're called the Yavis, the Yellowist, the Deuteronomic, and the Priestly. And these four traditions are combined and sometimes not very well edited. And so you get the same story told with two different versions frequently just juxtaposed beside each other. So in this story of the angels visiting Abraham, in some passages it seems to refer as if they're messengers from God. And in other passages, in the very same story, it seems to indicate that this was God himself encountering um, Abraham. And so the term is used in, in very, very different ways. Daniel is the first person to start using proper names for these messengers of God. And he'll name two of them particularly. He'll name Michael and Gabriel. As you'll find these two names in, in the book of Daniel itself. So they're like aspects of God. Now, after what's called post-exilic Judaism, when the Israelites come back from the land of Babylon, there's a huge shift in their thinking, in their theology. And so what had originally been a council of gods, and there are 12, hence the 12 tribes of Israel, and this notion of a council of 12 divinities you'll find all over the, the Middle East. You'll find it in the Sumerian pantheon. You'll find it in Mount Olympus with the Greeks. You'll find it in the Roman pantheon. And so this notion that there's a council of 12 divinities was very, very strong in Judaism. But now when they become monotheistic, these have to be collapsed down. So the Elohim, the gods, become Yahweh, a single divinity. What are you going to do now with the, um, the, the rest of the, the pantheon and those who had been formerly called the sons of God? they now kind of get reduced or demoted to angelic beings. So they're either aspects of God or they're messengers from God. And so you've got this very strange statement. It's in chapter 6 of the book of Genesis, where it says, The sons of God found the daughters of men to be very attractive, and they took them to wife as many as they wanted her, and they gave birth to the race called the Nephilim. They're given two different names in the Hebrew Scriptures. They're sometimes called the Nephilim, and they're sometimes called the Anakim. And so who are these sons of gods, yeah? and who are these daughters of men? What was happening between these two? If you fast forward within Judaism, right up to um, the Middle Ages, you've got a great, um, a great Jewish scholar called Maimonides, and Maimonides was teaching about angels, was that there were um, messengers from the divine, they're separate from God, they emanate from God, and they have particular functions, they're intermediaries between God, the one God, and planet Earth. So that's just a little qu a quick look at uh, Judaism and angels. Christianity obviously then picks up on that. Christianity, is, uh, I believe that when Judaism died, you know, after the second council was destroyed, the second uh, um, great temple was destroyed in 70 AD, you know, the dying Judaism gave birth to two children. So there would be, you know, uh, rabbinical Judaism and Christianity. For me, there were, there were twins begotten of a dying mother, two um, similar traditions. And Christianity tried to re revive, you know, there was no temple anymore in Judaism, there was no priesthood anymore in Judaism, there was no sacrifice anymore in Judaism after the temple had been destroyed. So um, Judaism, in one form, continued with a home version of um, sacrifice and, and, and uh, liturgy, and the other birthed Christianity, which was, it gave a new sacrifice, you know, um, a new form of worship, um, a Eucharistic celebration, so it birthed two kids. So Christianity is hugely influenced, obviously, by Judaism. So you find that in the 4th century particularly, with some of the great councils of the church, they will take up the, the subject of angels, and they'll debate furiously about it. Uh, but they will uh, try to uh, figure out what are the functions of these heavenly entities. And they'll have particular functions, and there'll be a particular hierarchy. And they'll actually create a hier hierarchy of nine different orders of angels. I can't remember them all. So you had angels, archangels, you had thrones, dominations, powers, uh, cherubim, seraphim. So you, you had nine orders of angels in the Christian dispensation. 
but they couldn't agree fully on whether or not these angels were physical entities, whether they had physical articulation, whether they manifested physically, or whether they were kind of uh, mental entities. They, they couldn't quite get their act together on that. There was different uh, belief systems. But you find it right throughout the New Testament, all stories of angels. So we have the story this morning. Joseph, you know, is told by an angel uh, in a dream that his wife Mary, his, alleged, his pledged wife, you know, is pregnant by the Holy Spirit. So the angel will come again and again to Joseph. He'll have many encounters with the angels. There'll be an encounter between Mary and Gabriel. So Gabriel will tell Mary that she is to be the mother of the Mashiach. Similarly, the father of John the Baptist to be will be warned, will be told by an angel as well, in the Holy of Holies, you're going to become a father. Your wife is going to give birth to a son. So you'll find the angels appearing at the birth of kids. You'll find the angels appearing uh, to the angels when Jesus has been born and alerting to the fact that the Messiah has been born in a little town called Bethlehem. You'll find um, angels appearing uh, in the last day of Jesus' life when he's really in crisis mode and really is seriously being tempted to abort his mission, you know, 12 hours before he's due to be crucified. And an angel is sent to try to console him and to bring him back into alignment with his purpose. And after he has risen from the dead, it's an angel that rolls back the, the rock from the door of the tomb and tells the women that he has risen. And there's a great story then in the Acts of the Apostles where Peter, Peter is jailed and he's you know, literally manacled inside in the cell. In the middle of the night, an angel comes and takes off that cuffs, opens all the doors, takes him out into the city, at least far away from the jail, and he says, okay, you're on your own now. And then he finds some Christian household. So you find it very, very strong in Christianity as well. Islam, there are six tenets of the Islamic faith that you have to believe in order to be, you know, a card-carrying uh, um, a Muslim. And uh, one of those is belief in angels. You have to believe that angels exist. But within Islam, uh, angels um, do not have free will. They're delegates of God, you know, who are totally dedicated to giving God's message and they have no free will themselves to decide whether or not they'll comply with it. So they're, they're told what to do and they go, they go do it. Mormonism has an interesting hit on angels. Cornish Joseph Smith, all angels who were involved with earth affairs were once themselves humans. So they're graduated human beings. They've all originally been human beings. And so, for instance, they believe that um, the first man, Adam, graduated and became the, angel, the archangel Michael, and that Noah graduated and became the archangel Gabriel, and that Moroni, who is a very important angel for Mormonism, that Moroni was actually a 5th century uh, pre-Columbian American prophet warrior that then you know, graduated and became an angel. And the sixth you know, kind of tradition I want to just mention is um, theosophy. Theosophy is with this um, great system set in place by Madame Blavatsky and uh, Leadbeater. Um, they refer to angels using the word typically devas. And they claim that there are two kinds that we encounter. There are uh, planetary angels and solar angels. So the planetary angels, according to theosophy, reside in the atmosphere literally, of the planets of our solar system. So obviously they're, they're not incarnated entities, so they're uh, living in some kind of etheric or astral realms, but they inhabit the atmospheres of the planets, and they're called planetary angels. And then there's a group of them that inhabit the sun. They're called solar angels. And obviously they're not physical beings. They wouldn't last, you know, very, very long in those kind of conditions. So they have astral or etheric existence. And their function, according to theosophy, is they actually guide the evolutionary process. So they're moving the entire evolutionary process forward. And they're involved even with the details of that process, literally helping plants to grow. And so they're involved right down to that at the minutia. And the belief system within theosophy was that if the third eye gets activated, the sixth chakra, if this gets activated, then you can see these entities. Um, and they believe that some angels were uh, formerly human beings, or a little bit like Mormonism. So that's the first section I want to talk about then. So that's just a quick survey of some of the wisdom traditions and what they have to say about it. For the second section now, I want to just uh, go on on my own and think about, you know, what, do I, what makes sense to me about it? And I divide this into six pieces as well. I'm going to give you a little bit of background information first. Secondly, I'm going to share with you again 
a dream I had on November the 8th just passed, and I spoke a little bit about it some few Sundays ago. I'm going to revisit for a few minutes. Thirdly, I want to talk about the communion of saints and extend that out. Fourthly, I'm going to ask myself, how advanced are angels? Fifthly, I want to look at what do I think their functions are? And then sixthly, I'm just going to mention what's the connection between angels and altered states of consciousness. So that's what I'll do briefly. So a little bit of background. I am totally convinced that there are two forms of religion on our planet. There is exoteric religion and there's esoteric religion. And I'm totally convinced that exoteric religion you know, has been taught to us by other people, are absorbed sociologically, whereas esoteric religion is an affair of the soul. It is not taught by anybody. It is a direct you know, influence of our soul self, our essence self. So they're very, very different from each other. Exoteric religion has to do with belief systems, dogma, creedal formulations, ritual, uh, biblical traditions, stuff like that. And it's always passed on by other people, our cultures to us, whereas the esoteric uh, mystical spirituality is literally, it is our birthright. It is who we are as soul beings. And this comes, in some senses, unmediated to us. When we plumb the depths of our own being, we encounter that place, and we don't need teachers, or we don't need kind of dogma or creedal formulation in order to, to access that place. Now, in order to be able to experience either form of religion, our brain needs to have developed to a certain extent. So we don't find, for instance, that even our closest relatives, chimpanzees, share 98.6% of our DNA with us. But you don't find chimpanzees organizing themselves into Sunday worship or sitting under a body tree meditating. So it takes some level of brain, you know, in order to be able to experience any level of religion. And so at some stage, obviously, in the evolutionary trajectory, at some stage, we broke through some kind of a neurological barrier where it became possible for us to experience religion in these two ways. Now, I want to suggest, and you've heard me say this a few times before, that where uh, exoteric religion is a sociological exercise where we pick up our belief systems you know, from the communities, uh, that esoteric religion comes directly from inside. And I believe that the exoteric religion came initially from encounters with extraterrestrial societies. When you read the Sumerian scriptures, they talk about a group called the Anunnaki. Now, there's a phenomenon in human culture called the uh, cargo cults, and it happens when a technologically sophisticated society happens upon technologically you know, unsophisticated natives. They begin to worship them. And this has happened in our own times. It happened in Micronesia during World War II when Japanese pilots and when American pilots began to land on some of these islands, these people, the local people, thought, literally they thought they were gods. They came down with all, this, all these kinds of goodies that they called cargo. And they watched these guys drill and they saw the equipment they had. And when they finally departed, a whole bunch of religions sprung up, which are called, you know, uh, generically, they're called the cargo cults. So these local people began to try to build airstrips or they tried to create radio antenna using bamboo shoots or whatever to try to imitate the technology that they had seen in the belief system that they could bring back these gods for more cargo so they get the goodies given back to them. So whenever a technologically sophisticated society meets a technologically unsophisticated society, the tendency is for them to be divinized. Now, according to the Sumerian legends, um, such a thing happened in our history uh, 445,000 years ago. Um, and the Hebrew scriptures will borrow hugely from this. And so these beings came down, uh, it seems, according to the stories, genetically modified us, took a group of Homo erectus hominids that they needed for work, upgraded them genetically so they were bright enough in order to be able to uh, work as gardeners and miners and eventually as soldiers in their own internecine warfare. And so in some senses, they gave us the breakthrough neurologically that allowed us as homo sapiens to be able to experience religion, both exoteric and esoteric. They taught us the exoteric because we were worshipping them. And this is what gets reflected in Judaism as the Elohim, the gods where there's a plurality and there's a council of 12. Whereas when Judaism becomes monotheistic, it collapses down to a single divinity. So that's much more like our instinctive realization that there is only 
there is only God, there is only source, there is only unity consciousness. And so, in some senses, this uh, upgrading of our intellect allowed us, for the first time ever, to experience religion of both kinds. But we've tended to follow more and to be indoctrinated more into the exoteric, whereas all the mystical uh, uh, religions will invite us deeply into the core of our own being. Now, in that process, then, it seems to me, um, when we finally began to move into a, an inner realization, these uh, council of twelve become some kind of angelic beings. If we now believe only in a single divinity, what are we going to do with these gods whom we formerly worshipped as divine? Now they'll be kind of repositioned in some kind of a hierarchical system. So that's a little bit uh, of the background. Now I shared with you a few weeks ago a very powerful dream I had on the, the 8th of November just passed. And I want to revisit it briefly uh, and speak about angels there. And in this uh, very, very powerful dream, I woke me up, it was so powerful, I woke up, turned on my leg, went over and drew a diagram because it came in diagrammatic form to me. And it was um, this huge, huge, huge light source, literally sun-sized light source, uh, beaming in all directions. But there's this long, long, long dark room in which there are no windows and no doors and no light source, this dark, dark, dark chamber. But somebody had uh, um, made apertures in one wall and there were shafts of golden light streaming through. And um, in, in front of each shaft of light was a prism that refracted it onto the other wall into red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo and violet. And in the dream, um, what I was being told was that the source represents God. This undifferentiated light represents God and that the wall with the apertures represented the Holy Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit is in that aspect of God that self-separates into these shafts of golden light, which I would call souls. And then the prism is the process of incarnation, where it takes the pure light of a soul and it refracts it onto a screen of reality, uh, where we experience ourselves in seven different levels. There's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. So there's our physicality, there's our etheric nature, there's our astral body, our emotional body, there's our mental body, there's our causal body, there's our uh, Atman, and there's a, a Brahman, Brahmanic consciousness. So we experience ourselves at seven different levels. Unfortunately, cultures come in and they impose a filter between the prism and the screen, and they filter out a whole bunch of colors. So when we live in this culture, for instance, the belief is there is only one color, red, our physicality. You know, and that's it. There's nothing else. And when we die, that's kaput. Now, in this dream vision, what I'm seeing as well is that there were many different kinds of apertures, different shapes. Sometimes it was just a little round hole. Sometimes it was a square. Sometimes a diamond. Sometimes a spiral. And so the shaft of light, the light is all the same light. It's all God. But the shafts, the intensities are very, very different. And so angels for me are a particular configuration of this light. Now, they're much more intense than we experience ourselves. So, in some senses, um, angels are to human beings like laser lights are to incandescent bulbs. Or maybe like starlight is to a firefly. So it's the same light. The light of a star and the light of a firefly are exactly the same light. They're all coming from source, but they have totally different intensities. And so, in some senses, the angels are particular configurations of this light, but they're the same light that radiates inside your soul and my soul. And when we know how to meditate and go back and go back through the apertures into unity consciousness, there is only the one light. So angels are just a particular manifestation or intensification of that kind of light. Which brings me then to the notion of communion of saints. And I addressed this a few weeks ago as well. It's a beautiful teaching in Catholic theology, the notion of the communal sense, except that the terminology is disastrous and it is extremely limited. So the terminology says that there are three kinds of souls uh, baptized, among baptized Catholics. There are the, what they call uh, the church uh, militant, which is us here on planet Earth, and there's the church triumphant, which is the guys who've made it to heaven. And there's the church suffering, who are the guys in purgatory. Now, the language is terrible, and it is far, far too confining. So there's one other group of baptized Catholics, and they're down below, because they ate meat on a Friday or something like this. But even if you include those, it's really confined. So I much prefer 
the, the, the Buddhist notion of the Bodhisattva. So the notion of all sentient beings, that everything that exists, as far as I'm concerned, is a word of God made flesh. Everything, whether it's a banana slug or a, a, a cabbage plant, an avatar or a poet, everything that exists is a word of God made flesh. It's a shaft of life, a shaft of light, which meets a particular kind of prism and articulates itself in some kind of different physicality. But it is all exactly the same light. And so the communion of saints for me is the extension of this notion that it involves all living, all sentient beings, whether they're uh, um, um, without any kind of physicality, whether they're pure intellect or pure virtue, as in the case of some angels, or whether they're you know, a deer in your backyard, grazing on your, in your lawn. Everything that exists is just a, a shaft of this light that went through a particular kind of prism. And that the communion of saints is not an invitation for people on earth just to pray for the souls in purgatory or to ask help from the people in heaven. It is to extend our compassion and our kindness for all living things. That everything that is is a word of God made flesh. They are brothers and sisters to us. And that the communion of saints is the invitation to take the bodhisattva vow, uh, to not you know, go back to the light completely until all of my brothers and sisters have awoken to their, true, uh, to their true destiny, who they really, really are. The fourth point I will make then is this. I will look then at um, how powerful are these entities? There's a great Russian scientist who several years ago um, spoke about there being three main types of civilizations in, in our galaxy. He said type one, type two, and type three. Type one, he suggested, would be civilizations that have learned to harness the energies of their own planet and to do so ecologically. And so they've uh, they're learned how to harvest their tides, wind, the sun, but they do it very, very responsibly and ecologically. He would call those a type one civilization. A type two civilization he would call a civilization that managed to do that for an entire solar system so that they've harnessed the energy of an entire solar system and they're doing it ecologically and responsibly. And a type three would be a civilization that has indeed mastered its entire galaxy and has harnessed the galaxy, energies of the galaxy again responsibly and again ecologically. Now, in some senses, it seems to me that angels fit somewhere <coughs> in this schemata. <coughs> that there are energies, there are entities of some kind who have learned uh, to live with extraordinary harmony in their environments <clears throat> and to harness their environments for their needs, but to do it in an ecologically responsible fashion. And so they do this really, really beautifully and really, really powerfully. So that's part of their grace, greatness, it seems to me. I think that there are beings who are moving through the two most important stages of uh, evolution into enlightenment, as far as I'm concerned, is the movement from free will to freedom and the movement from self-concern to compassion. Now, we all have to start off uh, being self-concerned. A little infant, you know, if it's not self-concerned, it won't survive the first few moments of life. If it doesn't learn how to breathe and how to uh, attach to a nipple, it won't survive. So self-concern is a very important part of the journey. But self-concern has to uh, evolve into compassion because they have to at some stage recognize that the self which is concerned about itself, in fact, is just a shaft of the light from the same source. And the same light is radiating through my neighbor and through my enemy and through all life forms. And so compassion is the natural extension of self-concern predicated on the notion that the self is the light. So that's the first movement of evolution. And the second movement is from free will to freedom. Now there's a big difference between the two of them. Free will is the ability to do as I please. Freedom is the ability to do as please as God. So the only truly free person is the person who instinctively is doing the compassionate, loving thing. To the extent that I'm not doing that, I'm enthralled to some kind of an addiction or a fear. And so the truly free person is the person who is uh, opting always to do God's will. Now, um, it's a difficult transition uh, from one to the other. So I believe that I think all angels have free will and most have freedom, but not all. Because the fact that you're technologically advanced 
or intellectually superior does not always translate into a moral equivalence. It doesn't always translate into a spirituality. So we can use technology for a lot of different nefarious purposes. But I believe that my understanding of angels is that they all have free will. And so I would kind of take issue with the Islamic view on that piece. But that not necessarily all of them have achieved freedom so that there are some dark forces out there. So my fifth point then is, <clears throat> what are some of the functions of these uh, entities? And I think the first function is that they are guardian slash playmate. So I remember a very interesting encounter I had um, in the, down in St. Thomas Aquinas Church here on Waverley, about let's say, 20 years ago. And I had just finished Mass, and I was back in the sacristy, and I was taking my vestments off, and a woman came in, and she said to me, you know that you have a guardian angel. I smiled and said, yeah, I, I, yeah. My great grandmother told me that. Yeah. She said, do you know her name? I said, no. She said, her name is Lauren. So I said, okay, thank you. Thanks for sharing. And she just turned and walked away. So about three weeks later, somebody gave me a book on angels and I was just leafing through it. And I came across a story of a person who encountered their guardian angel and the angel guardian said, and let me tell you what my name is. And before I turned the page, I began thinking, oh, what did that woman say to me a few weeks ago that my angel was called Laurie or Laurel? Or... I turned over the page, and the first word on the next page is Lauren. So I said, okay, okay, gotcha. So I'm going to give you a name from now on. <laughs> You're Lauren. And that's how I address her. You know, my, one of my first prayers in the morning and last this night is a prayer to Lauren, my angel guardian, to keep me safe during the day or during the night. And so there's a sense in which every single one of us is assigned a big brother, big sister. And the reason is this. Of all the planets, particularly in the Milky Way galaxy, I've often referred to this planet as the boot camp of the Milky Way galaxy. It really is. It's a really, really, really tough camp. There are other ways of incarnating. There are other dimensions and even other physical planets which are most, much easier than planet Earth. We come to a planet where where light and dark are almost equally divided, where good and evil are almost equally divided. It takes a lot of courage to volunteer for human incarnation. And so the Buddha will say, he will talk about it as this precious human body. It takes a lot of guts to say, yes, send me to Gaia. A lot of courage. And because you know, only the hardiest souls volunteer for it, they're assigned you know, a special cadre of uh, big brothers, big sisters, of guardian angels. Now, the problem, of course, is that 99.9% .9 of us are asleep at the wheel. We've forgotten completely about who we are or that we volunteered for here or what our mission was when we're down here. So we're, we're asleep at the wheel. But because we volunteered anyway, you know, these are the, here are these beings who are, who are here for us. So that's the first function. I think part of that is their playmates. So when I see little children and you're know, interacting with their imaginary friends, I do not believe that they're imaginary in the sense we normally define it. I've said to you many times that my definition of imagination is the following. I do not believe that imagination is a faculty that allows us to make up stuff which is not real. I do not believe that. That's fantasy. Imagination, rather, is the ability to volitionally shift my state of consciousness enter different dimensions, witness and interact with entities and energies in those different dimensions, learn from them, and bring back what I've learned into this reality and cross-fertilize it and therefore extend my, my cartography of reality. And kids do that naturally. Kids have just recently come from there. They haven't been shut down yet. This filter between the prism and the screen isn't fully in place yet. So they're interacting with real entities. Until we shut them down and we educate them. So these imaginary playmates of little kids are not imaginary in the sense of being fantasies. They're imaginary only in the sense that kids instinctively shift dimensions and encounter these beings and, and play with them. So that's the kind of the first set of um, functions for the angels. I think angels are also midwives. You know, I said to you many, many, a long time ago that there are six great traumas you know, in, in the history of life. The first great trauma, I believe, was God's self-separation, where this unity consciousness articulated itself into souls. That was a traumatic event for God. But after that, there are five great traumas that the rest of us experience. And the first great trauma is what I've called the launching pads. 
It is when a soul volunteers for incarnation, setting aside the limitless possibility of living in the eternal now with cosmic consciousness and settling instead for being crushed claustrophobically into a tiny little fetus, having a tiny little laptop to operate from and being subjected to the notion of chronology and time and moreover having amnesia for who we really are you know, and why we've come. So the launching pad is when we take the jump. We volunteered for incarnation and now we're about to jump. That's a, an extraordinary traumatic time in the life of any soul. And there are angels out there to midwife us through that process. The second great trauma, I believe, is what I call the docking, when the soul docks with the embryo or the fetus. And I don't necessarily believe that a soul comes in at the moment of conception. It can come in at any stage of the pregnancy. But when it finally docks with the evolving embryo or fetus, it's now literally trying to figure out how does this machine work? How do I get energy into this hand? You know, how do I curl my toe? You know, how do I stick my tongue out? And so the little child, literally embryo, you know, the soul is trying to learn how to work this space out. That's really frustrating for a soul. The angels are midwifing that process. When it comes to the birth process, and now we have to kind of claustrophobically spelunk through a cave, where through you know, contractions pushing us forward, that's really, really you know, traumatic. Again, the angels are present at that stage. The fourth one is the evolution of the ego. When at about the age of eight months that the little baby finally realizes horrifically there is not just one organism here called the mother slash baby of which I'm in charge. There are two organisms and she has all the power. She can walk away. She's like a, a, a train and a carriage. She can uncouple and just go off down the tracks and I'm left to my own. That is a horrifically traumatic event for a child. Angels are present at that. And the final great trauma is what we call death. It's when we shuffle off this mortal coil. Now that we've forgotten about who we really are and we've become identified with the spacesuit, you know, letting go of the spacesuit and re-engaging with our etheric, astral, and mental, causal, Atman and Brahmanic consciousness, that's really traumatic. The angels are present for that. So a huge function of them is to midwife us through these great traumas in our life. I think uh, another function of them is that they are indeed messengers and that particularly they come at times of great crisis, not just for individuals, but for nations or entire communities, even for the global community. And that there has never been a significant shift in consciousness which has not been precipitated by some kind of a, uh, a global or a cosmic uh, uh, catharsis or crisis. So at these periods of time, the angels come, you know, to tell us, you know, this is how birth happens. This is how evolution occurs. You know, you've got to stay with the, with the process here. So they're messengers of this uh, process for us. So th they are the functions. I think as well that depending on the complexity of the system, whether it's an individual, uh, individual human being, or whether it's a planet, or whether it's a galaxy, or even a cosmos, that angels of greater and greater, greater sophistication, you know, be our big brother, big sister to that particular system. Uh, um, a cosmic system or a galactic system or a planetary system or a solar system or an individual organism, that there are angels at various stages shepherding this evolutionary process forward. And the last point I want to make is this. It's fascinating to me that in all of the biblical accounts, uh, when you have um, angelic encounters, that they either happen when the person is in an altered state of consciousness to begin with, or they create an altered state of consciousness when they occur. And because shifting your state of consciousness, you know, if you're not practicing it a lot, can be really, really scary. And so the first thing an angel almost always says in a biblical encounter is, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. You know, and we're shifting your state of consciousness really dramatically. We're allowing you now to experience totally different kinds of reality. It's going to blow your circuits, literally blow your circuits. Even your own circuitry is going to be temporarily blown. You know, but do not be afraid. You we're coming with love and coming with peace. So that has to be said many, many times. And so the secret then to angelic encounters, as it is indeed to any kind of mystical experiences, is to have the courage to shift your state of consciousness. Whether you do that by spending time in nature, or you do it by meditation, or you do it by spending time with little children, that you have to have the courage to volitionally shift your state of consciousness in order to be in the space in which these angelic or mystical experiences can occur. Thank you, guys. So we'll open it up to question and answer discussion. Johanna.
and just grab the mic. I was just going to talk about a practice that I used to do um, when I lived here in Palo Alto in the 70s. Okay. And my sister had just died, and I was going through a very difficult divorce, okay. and times emotionally were very hard for me. And a roommate of mine had a, a little book, and it talked about ways to bring the angels to you, and I focused on the joy angels, Brilliant. which was you took a little flower every day, okay. so I'd go find a little tiny flower from somewhere, yeah. put it in water, and offer it to the joy angels. Beautiful. Uh, they can, you can ask for angels to come. Absolutely, absolutely. That's beautiful, Johanna. And I think that, I think angels uh, totally uh, work with the prime directive notion, that they do not intervene without being invited in. And but there are many ways in which we invite people in. So sometimes we can do this unconsciously. Anybody who's hurting, you know, ipso facto, is reaching out for some kind of assistance, even if they're doing it unconsciously or subconsciously. Um, so they can move in in those instances, but they don't interfere. They're not going to gain, say, our free will, because we, like them, are being invited to make the transition from free will to freedom. So there have to be choices over which we have control. And there has to be the invitation to move from uh, self-concern to compassion. But they will cooperate with us if there's any kind of an invitation being extended. And the more, the more conscious the invitation, obviously, the easier it is for them to kind of interact with us. Yeah. Great. Prue, really Prue. I really appreciate you um, talking about children. Sure, and sure. I've been a grandmother now for a number of years, okay. and um, my eight-year-old granddaughter, Annabelle, okay. has just uh, shown me angels many times. And I, I've, especially since she's, I think, the evolution from six to eight. Yes. And it, it was all about Easter and um, Santa Claus and okay. uh, the fairies yes. and how she's worked through with what she's learned. That's and and um, uh, Santa Claus ne is real. Yes. And now that she's eight, yes. the Santa Clauses that are down here, yes. they're messengers. Yes. And they take, they write things down yes. and they let Santa Claus know yes. Yes. What, what she wants. That's what she told me That's two days ago. And um, she, ha she has fairies in the backyard Beautiful. that work in the garden. Beautiful. And um, so we have little statues to the fairies. Right. And sometimes she goes out and feeds them yes. with little yes. whatever it is right. that she puts on the, right. on the roses. Right. And these are all real things. Right. And I, I think as a parent, I wasn't able to enter those places, you know, being mm -hmm. in the science yes. realm. Yes. But as a grandparent, yes. you know, I just enter with her as best I can. And That's beautiful proof. It's a, it's a, a huge joy. So totally. I just share that with That's so important that all of these are real. Everything kids report, everything artists report, everything mystics report, they're all real. It's only a question of, have you the you know, ability to, to shift the state of consciousness to interact with them? There's just a different frequency, different vibration. It's like when I grew up in Ireland as a small child, we, really, we only had uh, three radio stations available to us. There was Radio Aaron, the Irish one, there was BBC, and there was Radio Luxembourg. And everything else was just crackly static. And no matter how much you, you dialed the knob, you could only access one of these three. The truth is there's hundreds of them out there, but the equipment wasn't sophisticated enough to pick up on particular frequencies. So the process of evolution, spiritually, is about learning to dial with infinite sensitivity all of the dimensions and all the frequencies out there. So the little kids do it instinctively because they've just come from that place. You know, and so fairies are totally real. I encounter them myself in the forest on a regular basis. You know, the Santa Claus is real. Any archetype, you know, which has gripped the human imagination is there because it represented some kind of an encounter or some kind of an experience that our ancestors had. So they're totally real. So playing with little children and not kind of patronizingly indulging their fantasies, but entering into their imagination, you know, and seeing the world through the eyes of, Christ, of, of the child. This is exactly why Christ says, you won't even enter the kingdom of heaven unless you become like little children. Yeah. 
That's, that's beautiful. Thanks a minute. Bill. Bill. Um, yeah, here. We want to get you on tape, Bill. Oh, okay. Here's an experience that I had with my guardian angel, okay. whose name I don't know. Okay. But I was, uh, I was 32 years old, and I was taking flying lessons. And when you're learning how to fly, you have to do night landings. Okay. Because you can't really be a pilot unless you can fly at night. And when you do night landings, you notice the blue, the blue runway lights on airports? They, they give you an, a, um, an illusion, an optical illusion, and that is when you're coming in for a landing, you think that the ground is here, okay. when in reality it's okay. about six feet, seven feet below where okay. you think. Okay. And so when they, when they teach you to do night landings, they say you need to turn the lights off, turn your, your, uh, your headlight off on the airplane okay. because that'll, that'll fool you. So you turn the, the light off and you turn some red lights on inside the aircraft because the eye can handle the red light. Okay. And then you're able to deal with the, with the illusion, with the optical illusion of the blue lights. Well, I was coming in for, I was doing my first night landing all by myself, and I'm coming in for this for the landing, and I've set up my flaps, and I've bled off my airspeed, and I've, 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 you know, I'm really at, at stall speed now. And suddenly, remember, I'm in the left seat, and suddenly I get a tap on my left shoulder, but a, a hard tap. Right. And, and, and this voice yells, turn on the lights and push the throttle to the wall now. So I flip on the lights and I look and I see I am ready to land on the propeller. I'm oh, about right. 50 feet short of the runway. Oh, I'm much lower than I thought I was. And I know, anybody who's flown an aircraft knows, if you land on the propeller, you die. <laughs> it's over. And so, so I flipped on the lights and I push the throttle to the wall, and of course the plane mushed because, because I was underneath the power curve. And so the plane wanted to take off, but it really didn't have enough uh, angle of attack to do that. And so I mushed, and I banged the tail on the ground at, a couple of times, and then finally the plane just kind of uh, picked up, and I was able to do a go-around and, and do my landing. And but let me tell you something, those taps on the shoulder, Holy mackerel, it was like by being hit with a hatchet. And, and that was a very real, real experience to me. And that's why I'm here today, because of those two taps. We're, we're real happy, Bill. Thank you so much, buddy. Thank you, buddy. Patricia was first, and then Patrice, and then George. You mentioned that um, our brains enter an altered state of consciousness. And I think. Um, Everybody in this room has experienced that. I know that I have um, at those times of physical pain yes. with the disease yes. or yes. mental pain yes. with the disease. And yes. the angels come in crises. Mm -hmm. yes. And you said something really important. You said, do not fear. Yes, absolutely, Patricia. Thank you so much, Levine. Thanks, Amanda. Patrice and then George. And then Alicia. Um, <clears throat> I don't think Mike would mind me sharing this. Okay. Excuse my voice, I've got sure. a cold. Uh, I don't think Mike would mind me sharing this because he's alluded to this to many people and, okay. and to you as well, Sean. But when this little baby was born eight uh -huh. months ago, he would cry yes. two or three times a day. And I think, oh my God, what, you know, what is going on here? Uh -huh. But over time, it still happens, not uh -huh. two or three times, but maybe once a day, he really, he really senses yes. this baby's uh, joy and okay. source. Right. And it's been beautiful to watch. That's it's gorgeous. no longer frightening. At first it was disconcerting, but mm -hmm. we all we understand it now. So you're saying Mike was the one crying during the day? Y yes. Wow. That's yes. beautiful. Yes, he just completely That's beautiful. went into okay. that space. Got if you totally will. touched by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It's been beautiful to watch, but at first it was disconcerting. That's great, so Patrice. Thank Thanks so many, Naveen. Thank you, Pat. George and then Alicia. About 13, 13 years ago, I went to, I think I, spe I told you about this before, but I'd like to share it. 13 years ago, I was at a spiritual sanctuary in Hawaii where it was all silence except when I worked with my teachers. Beautiful, 3,000 feet above Hilo. And um, after about six days, my teacher was talking to me and he said, your guardian angel is standing right, he said your guide right. is standing right okay. behind you and his name is Jonathan. And Jonathan means a lot to me because the book Jonathan the and Siegel said dare to be everything you can be. And, uh, and we spoke and, and I won't go into all of that. 
And uh, I walked in the library and I opened the book, Conversations with God. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I saw was, how do I know I'm not imagining you? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, how else yes. can Brilliant. I communicate with you Brilliant. except through your imagination? Brilliant. Now, the longer I got away from that, yeah. the more I doubted it. The more okay. I thought, no, no, this couldn't have happened. Right. Then you spoke one day about yeah. the three levels. Okay. The physical level, okay. the, phys the, the, the physical level, the energy level, mm -hmm. and the spiritual level. Okay. And that helped me to realize, my God, right. I, I, this, this did happen to me. Right. I've try I went back trying to see him again, but I think I was working too hard. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've never seen him again, but, but yeah. I know he's there, so I know yeah. there's other life. Right. Okay. Uh, second thing, I'll be quick about this. Yeah. You say the word of God made flesh. Yes. You may not want to talk about it today. Or okay. you might have talked about it before, okay. but you give a sermon on what you mean by the Word of God okay. made flesh. Okay, make a quick answer to that before we go over to Alicia. So there's this beautiful passage in the prologue to John's Gospel where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, um, that is absolutely accurate, except it is completely limited. Um, Christian theology has latched onto this as um, a theology of Jesus and that Jesus, as the second person of the Blessed Trinity, was the only entity uh, for, of, uh, of whom that is uh, correct, and I don't believe that to be the case at all. That everything that exists, as far as I'm concerned, is a word of God made flesh. So the, the denser the realms are, the longer it takes for a thought to translate into physicality, but it eventually does. And so this, um, this seat here, this wooden object, uh, originally existed as a thought in some carpenter's mind. And so the thought gave birth to this. And in fact, the materials of which it's composed and the machines of which it was, which were used to make it were thought forms. But when human beings, you know, a lot of human beings come to the same thought form with some consistency and intensity, it gets translated into physical articulation. But there's a time lapse. There's a time, you know, a deferred time. Because if we were able to translate every idle thought into physicality, the freeways would be littered with dead bodies. Because every time somebody cut me off and we swear an obscenity at them, you know, the guy would die. So there's, there's the principle of the deferred outcome when you live in very dense bodies with very dense minds. When you live in subtler, subtler realms, thoughts translate immediately into articulation. So nothing is obviously as subtle and as causal as, as source. So for God to be, for God to think, is for God to create, or for God to emanate or to manifest. So every thought of God manifests immediately, uh, either in a physical form, into a spirit form, into a virtue form, or whatever. And so you look around you, and everything you find is the Word of God made flesh. The Word that God had in the mind at some stage, God enfleshed or incarnated. There is nothing that is not a Word of God made flesh. Everything was a thought form in source that got articulated into either physicality or intellectuality or emotionality or, or, or pure virtue. So we got to Alicia, and then Jean. I guess my Will question... you hold it up closer, Alicia? Closer? Yeah. Is that yeah. better? Okay. Yeah. Um, so my question is, um, I believe in reincarnation, and I, f I was seven years old when I realized I was back. <laughs> wow. For wow. myself. And I know people say, oh, okay. you don't know. When you reincarnate, you okay. don't have memory of your past. And I did. Good for, and, you. Um, Good for you. So I've always known that... That's brilliant. I, you reincarnate, and I grew up Catholic, so okay. that wasn't difficult. <laughs> so I never said anything. <laughs> conflict of interest. Yes, conflict of interest. Okay. Um, but I also know my mom believes strongly in angels, and okay. she has all these books on angels okay. and communicating with your angel. And I happen to be, I ran into a book, and I started to read it, and okay. I tried, to, it tells you how to communicate, and okay. it goes through a process, and okay. like you meditate, and um, I heard, the, I, heard I, I wanted to hear Okay. my guardian angel and the voice came and said you know said my name but okay. it freaked me out and <laughs> wow. okay. i didn't i just was like okay this is like weird. Okay. um but my question is when you reincarnate yeah. do you have the same angel or are you assigned a different angel okay. <laughs> <laughs> it depends how much progress you made in the last incarnation yeah. if you really hit a home run you're going to get a, a much more involved being looking after you. I'm, I'm only, I'm only semi-facetious. Obviously, as every um, 
organism or every energy form you know, moves you know, toward enlightenment, there will be different levels of complexity, different need different levels of teaching. And so, for instance, without in any way being judgmental, you know, a university professor and a kindergarten teacher, in some senses, uh, it calls for a different level of pedagogy or uh, information. And so as we move in the enlightenment, we're going to call upon guides who are more practiced or more kind of au fait with the issues that we will be encountering. But I want to just make one comment to you, Alicia. Um, last Sunday was the kids' mass, and all of the kids performed in various ways. Alicia wrote a story that she had written herself, and her kids illustrated it. Now, I guarantee to you that the inspiration for that was a brilliant story, and I've encouraged you to get it published. The inspiration for that came from your angelic guides. So there's, you're channeling this material. The difference between real art and fake art, one is channeled and the other is the, the, an artifact of ego. And so you're obviously in touch still with the, your guide form. So continue to develop and, to kind of, and um, um, develop the, that particular gift that you have. Brilliant. Jean, and then Pat. So we've been talking about good angels, but right. okay. and it's probably a whole other yes. lecture. Okay. Like if you get an advice and it's bad advice, is that because it's not coming from the source, or is there another place that that's coming from, like bad angels? Okay. Is there such a thing as bad okay. angels? Okay. That's a great question, Jean. And my answer, short answer is yes. That it, the reason I said that all angels have free will, but not all ages are freedom, have freedom. Uh, um, technological evolution or even intellectual development is no guarantee of moral, you know, kind of uh, ethical behavior. And we see this in our own times. You know, in some senses, the difference between a caveman you know, and a modern scientist is that when a caveman gets angry, he gets out of his cave and he hits somebody with a cudgel you know, and brain whacks an individual. When a modern scientist, you know, allied to the military-industrial complex, develops an intercontinental ballistic missile you know, and gets angry, one nation gets angry and fires us across, you're talking about the deaths of millions of people. So the, the kind of energy is the same, but the technology is, is very, very different. So technological de development or even intellectual development is no guarantee of moral development. So yes, I believe that there are, there are entities because they're being given free will. You cannot get to freedom without having free will. You can't jump from being an instinctive, uh, an animal driven by instinct in, to respond to the environment to being a totally free person without going through learning the use of free will. That's a very necessary stage. And free will is meaningless. It's a charade, unless there's opportunities for making bad choices. And so because the opportunities are there, some beings make bad choices. And if you're intellectually very, very bright, your bad choices can be devastating. And if you live, for instance, in a disincarnate form where your energy system is either ability to, uh, to, to kind of do psychotronics uh, to influence other minds, you know, whether it's a, a purely disincarnate way of influencing outcomes, they're very, very real. You're influenced by your own emotions. You're influenced by your own thoughts as much as you are by physical things in your environment. And so I, I believe that there are entities who have consistently chosen self-concern over compassion. And that leads to greed and leads to violence and it leads to kind of um, um, uh, predatory kinds of behavior. And so it is very important for us, as you stand at the entrance to any portal, you have to make sure that you're surrounded with light and that you're calling in energies and entities, you know, which are beings of light and beings of love. Because once you enter a portal, there's no guarantee of what you're going to encounter on the way. And you experience this every night when you dream. You know, sometimes you're going to have really difficult dreams nightmares even occasionally because you're traveling astrally through two realms the lower astral realm where there are disincarnated discombobulated souls who haven't moved towards the light because they're confused you're going to encounter some of those and the higher astral realm is the realm of the angels so you have to be really really careful that you're protected which is why we were taught angel of god my guardian dear to whom this uh, like can see here, ever this night be at my side to light and guard, to rule and guide. You really need to, to safari you know, with, uh, with uh, light companions. Yeah. So somebody said that, Pat. And then Brigitte. Sorry? 11. So we'll just take this and we'll, we'll end with Brigitte. Thank you. Um, 
maybe I misheard, but, okay. but um, I think that you said at one point that you were talking about free will and, and you said, um, I have issues with Islamism about this. Yes, and only, oh yeah. only having to do with angels. In the Islamic system, angels do not have free will. Oh. I'm not saying that Muslims believe that we don't have free will as individuals. They do believe that. <coughs> but they don't believe that angels have free will, that angels are designated messengers from God who are given a specific task and role, and they have no choice in the matter. But the Islam <coughs> obviously believes in free will for so human they beings. just deliver the message? Just deliver the message. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, sure. So we end with Brigitte. You said that uh, angels were believed to have been once humans. Yes. When I studied catechism as yes. a child, yes. we were told that devils were once angels. Yes. Uh -huh. And I'm confused about this. Uh, could you explain? <laughs> <laughs> could you, you know, Lucifer is, yeah. means bearer, bearer of light. Of light. Yeah. So Lucifer. Yes. must have disobeyed. What exactly did they do to deserve to be made devils? Okay, okay. So, <laughs> obviously, our languaging is pejorative, you know. So what we have to look at is kind of the, uh, the cosmology of how reality is experienced. So when we were, I was talking to Jean, that, you know, if free will, and once free will enters the, uh, the equation, there is the possibility for good or bad. Before free will enters it, it's not possible. So I've told this story years ago. I don't know if you'll remember it or not. I was down in, um, when I was living in St. Aloysius Church down here, there was a little park nearby that I used to go down to regularly. And I went to the park one day, and there was an adult female with two little children walking in the park. A little boy about five and a little girl about seven. And all of a sudden, a baby squirrel fell out of the tree. And the female adult ran over and caught it and started whacking it off the ground. And the kids are screaming, don't, stop, 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 stop doing that. So I rush in and I rescue the little squirrel. It died anyway. I buried it actually in the, in the backyard of St. Aloysius Church. It's still there, I presume. Now, do you think that was, that female adult did a morally bad thing? What would you say? Okay. If I give you one more piece of information and ask you the same question. This female adult was an Alsatian dog. Does that change the equation? So dogs don't have free will. Dogs are driven by instinct, pretty much. You know, you see an animal, you're a predator, you go for it. So free will and morality only enter the equation. And morality only enters the equation with the advent of free will. So a little infant, you know, is neither moral nor immoral. It is amoral. It still hasn't got the cognitive equipment to make uh, um, informed decisions. It will come around age six or seven or whatever. And so uh, only with the advent of free will is our moral decisions possible. Um, but once moral decisions are possible, we can make good choices or bad choices. If we make choices for selfishness on a regular basis, you know, it becomes dark energy. So if we start throwing pejoratives at that and calling them demons or whatever, it's not helping the equation. It's identifying the result of making choices. <coughs> Uh, so it just means that when uh, they're all beings of light, Lucifer as the light carrier is a shaft of light that came through an aperture in that wall. But at some stage, this entity, you know, uh, archetypally at least, is making choices for selfishness. And that, you know, then in some senses creates the notion of fallen angels. Now, there's actually, there's a biblical idea of the fallen angel, which is slightly different. And that comes from Genesis chapter 6. And it's this notion that the sons of God found the daughters of men very attractive and they took them to wife, you know, and they raised up a new race called the Nephilim. So in the Sumerian scriptures, um, that action happened when the sons of the uh, Anunnaki started breeding with human females, which were already a hybridization between Homo erectus and Anunnaki seed, to be, to be uh, created a race of slaves. And now they started breeding with those. So it was, it was re regarded almost as bestiality, that here were these sons of God breeding with these hominids from planet Earth. So this goes way back. Way back. And that was why the flood was sent, according to the Sumerians, to punish that action 
on the part of the sons of God. So they're the called the fallen angels. So there's a lot of different traditions as to who these fallen angels actually are. <coughs> so guys, guys, I thank you so much for your patience. We need to get on with Mass. So uh, before we continue with our Eucharist, let's offer each other a sign of peace, but make it just a greeting, not a conversation. Otherwise, we're going to be here until 2 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs>